All right. Welcome everyone uh, in the audience uh, this evening to uh, our conversation with Donna Nelson, which is part of the Atlantic Lecture Series. I'd like to thank everybody who may be joining us online this evening as well. Um, before we begin, I have some thank yous to uh, provide to. First of all, I want to thank our colleagues in the Art Department in the School of Arts and Humanities at Claremont Graduate University and the MFA students who are joining us this evening. Uh, the Atlantic Lecture is put on uh, in conjunction with the art department. Uh, the art department produces it and we're just very lucky at the Sotheby's Institute of Art uh, at Claremont Graduate University to be able to take part to produce these conversations downtown for uh, a different audience and some different students. Um, so thank you, David Pagels in the audience, my colleague, I'm very pleased that, that you're here this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my team, Matthew O'Connor and Jody James, who helped produce these events. Uh, I also want to thank, in particular, Jill Stigall, who's providing a great link uh, to the art department for us as one of our dual degree candidates in both art business and the MFA program, and has been doing a great job. Um, and then, even though I don't see her in the audience currently, Vanessa Canas, who's been also helping us out um, producing these events, so thank you to everybody who's making this possible. Um, my name is Jonathan Neal, I'm the director of Sotheby's Institute of Art at Claremont Graduate University. Um, it gives me great pleasure this evening to have a conversation with Donna Nelson, who has been exhibiting since the early 1970s, is an early graduate from the Whitney Independent Study Program uh, in 1968, a very prestigious program in New York that has put out many interesting artists and curators over the years and continues to operate to this day. Uh, Donna is a uh, unique painter, a uh, unique artist who has been, I would say, redefining the practice uh, year after year uh, and has been pushing it in new directions uh, in, in, in ways that I think are incredibly contemporary when you, you see the work, and I think many people think that as well. Um, she's won many prestigious grants, including a Guggenheim. She has taught in many prestigious institutions. Uh, including at Yale and uh, at the Bard Summer Program, uh, but I understand for more than 25 years has made a home at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Donna this evening to have a conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> So as I promised, can everybody hear us? So as I promised, this would be low impact. <laughs> um, because I understand that you delivered a very uh, excellent talk before, and we brought a bunch of images from the talk, as well as some that I've, uh, that I've brought together um, this evening that I think that we can talk about. But um, I'd love to, to, to start off uh, with a little retrospection. Can you tell me what the Whitney Independent Study Program was like in 1968. Well, it, I don't think it was really what the independent, Whitney Independent Study Program is like now. It was uh, just starting, and uh, the only reason I was really there <laughs> is that uh, it was started by Ron Clark and Gary Bauer, and they were graduate students at Ohio State University, and I was an undergraduate there and they were looking for students. So now, of course, it's a very difficult program to get in. It's, you know, very intellectually rigorous and so on. But at that time, it was a, mostly all painters, and now hardly anybody paints in the Whitney program. And, uh, you know, also, I think that it, that, well, for me, it provided a place of uh, freedom, of basically being in New York in the 60s with the Fillmore East and the hippies and all of the excitement of New York at that time. And to come from the Midwest, from Ohio, Nebraska, where I had lived, and then just be put down in New York was fantastic. And I just spent all my time basically walking around in the city. And so, I was very, very young. I was very young and uh, my main education was the city of New York and looking at the city and looking at the great shows. I remember the shows. 
Can you, can, you, can you tell me a couple that were particularly memorable? Yes, there was the first Don Judge show at the Whitney Museum, which I think he later kind of didn't like that really early work, the, the plywood boxes and so on, but I love that work. And I do remember that work very, very well. And, um, oh, I remember a Lichtenstein show. I remember the great shows at the Jewish Museum. And um, the primary structures, primary structures, Jasper Johns. You know, I I I remember looking at art and uh, and the first Agnes Martin show I saw at uh, Courtier Ekstrom Gallery on Madison Avenue, and I remember every painting. I remember them by name. So uh, that was the big thing to me. That 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 was the education rather than reading and writing papers. <laughs> like they do now, what you say. Yes. <laughs> so it strikes me very interesting that, that that was a period of time in New York that was formative for a lot of people and was formative for a lot of the, the, the subsequent history of art in the United States and, and more broadly. And it seems like you have, you've, you've more recently come to land on the on the self-definition of yourself as a materialist in your painting, yes. and, um, and, it, and, it, and I'm wondering how much of that time in New York in the late 60s and early 70s informs that idea of your practice and of your work as an artist as a materialist. Well, that's kind of an interesting question because in the in the 70s, I was doing, I had my first show at Rosa Esmond in 1975, and I was doing kind of a geometric abstraction. And uh, I subsequently don't have those paintings anymore. And they were more, much more compositional and so on, but I was always really interested in what the paint did. And even in those paintings, I would take oil paint and put it on cardboard for 15 or 20 minutes and scrape it off so it was really stiff and they were very, very dense paint. And I didn't quite know what to do at that time with that love of paint. And actually the compositions that I was using, um, that, that the paintings were, didn't exactly go with that materiality, which is why the paintings don't exist anymore. But um, I, I, I have just a natural, I come from a family of farmers, and I always feel that painting and farming is kind of related. Oh, why is that? Well, because it's dirt and pigments you dig out of the ground, you know? And stretchers are made of wood, and fences are made of wood. And I really um, don't like the idea that the, that the material that you make the painting from is less is somehow less important than the painting. So I, I you know, it's just I think it's a it's a kind of an instinctual, you know, just response I have to painting and and my painting subsequently years later actually is more related to my painting I did in high school, just on my own, you know, than what I was surrounded with in like the late sixties, early seventies. At the same time, the late 60s and early 70s, there were so many artists who were leaving painting behind yes. and, and working with the materials of, of paint, but were leaving behind, let's say, the, the kind of structure or address or whatever it is that we might think of that has to be there for something to qualify as a painting. Uh -huh. um, so thinking about Linda Bankless doing these pores on the ground and, and so take, taking taking latex and taking material and letting it kind of exist on its own. What kept you committed to painting or committed to that, to that very, arrangement? Well, I'm very interested in uh, the contradiction between the materiality of paint and in the natural illusion that painting has. It's a, it's a very profound contradiction. It's like a human being. In our flesh, we think. And I think it's a very, very profound and philosophical form. And uh, so I'm always, I never wanted to let go of, of actually painting. And um, 
I also never I was kind of resistant to a lot of stuff that was going on in the 70s because the, there was a big strong idea about progress in painting. Mm -hmm. And I've always been interested in the world tradition of painting, the ancient tradition of painting. And Chinese painting and, and Bacholi painting and all kinds of paintings. So I always thought the idea that we were somehow progressing was absurd. Because the cave painters were very sophisticated. <laughs> right, so this, this idea that, that somehow painting was dead or this, you know, yeah, this no. thing that keeps getting announced over and over again. Right. This, thing about, this thing about illusion of materiality is very interesting, though, as, as, uh, as a, a commitment to what painting can be without needing to impose upon it a kind of image or uh, impose upon it a um, figure or iconicity or something like that in order to tell a story, right? right, right. Um, but yet by the 1980s you had, you were, you were, you were painting figures. You were right. much more in a kind of, con I wouldn't say conventional, but you had, you had picked up a, a, let's say a genre of work that much more recognizable than the material-based, process-based abstraction. What, what drove you to, to kind of attract it to the figure? I'll pull some of these images up since we have them. Don't, I, we'll, we'll, well get back to these I, I, um, at, at a certain point, I felt that my paintings were not um, mine enough. They looked too much like, it was the beginning of the art world, and they looked, you know, with the big galleries in Soho and so on. And at a certain point, I just looked at my paintings and I thought they were too formalist and too much like what was being done. And I thought somehow I have to, um, I have to work through who I am. And um, I started painting from life, which I had done just a little bit at Ohio State because it was a very conceptual school. So I never really done that. So that painting on the left is like one of the first, <laughs> you know, figures, and I couldn't get the face right at all. It looks like a mask. And I was looking at. Uh, uh, Picasso's Rose Period at the time. So it's not quite the political statement that it might seem. It's just that I was inept <laughs> at doing the face. And um, I started with the feet and did, I worked up to the face and then I just you know, could not get her face and I worked all, all week on the face and finally the model got mad and left. <laughs> It was, it, it, so that's, that's I, I, I like that story a lot because there, this is. Uh, oh, yeah. Da, so, Don, Don and I sat for maybe 10 minutes before we sat down with this talk and, and combined images that I had found and images that, that Donna had brought. Um, and I was interested in this move from figuration to abstraction, which is often narrated in. The, the, the history of European modernism. Um, but if anybody's been to the Clifford Still Museum uh, in, in Denver, there are these wonderful early Clifford Stills, and that's what you're looking at on the left. This is a still from 1935, um, which then gives way to these kind of magnificent abstractions that Still was doing in the 1950s and into, into the 60s. Um, and so I was, I was channeling that when I was looking at Donna's work from the, from the 1980s, and then the work that that, come, that comes later. But we, 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 and then, and then, can you talk a little bit about the image on the right and why they Well, the image on the together? right is uh, from the Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology, and I went through it. I don't take photographs, you know, at all, and I went through it with a photographer friend and just asked her to take some of these uh, uh, fragmented. Uh, and worn out statues from all over the world that are in the museum, and I just happen to love that photograph. And um, I'm really interested in things that have formerly been an image and then have have undergone decay. So, the, but the image is still there, but it's it's there in a different way than uh, than it was with the detail and so on. So it's, uh, it's less graphic, and in many ways, it's more fleshy. It's stone, but it's more fleshy. So I love that Clifford Still. It's just hilarious, and it's great. Yeah, there, there, there are a bunch of, of these 
these these a very interesting ones from the 30s. Obviously, it's kind of Depression era still, which yeah. um, I'd always been interested in still, but then I was really interested in still yeah. when, when I saw this series. So, but but we're not here to talk about still. Um, I want to I'm going to zip back to the top here because I really like what you just said about this idea of of, of images in decay. And so I'm going to ask you. It's an obvious segue. You, you become more well known recently for this double-sided work and this right. relationship between front, the, the, what could be the front of the canvas and the back of the canvas and the way that these images relate to one another. Do you consider the, let's say the B side of the canvas or the back side of the canvas as the kind of, as that more fleshy side or as a, um, as a example well, of the Well, they're, they're all different. You know, I mean, I have three different ways of like making two-sided paintings. And uh, in this particular painting, uh, this was a prepped painting, so the first thing I did was put the uh, gel medium grid on the front. And a lot of times I'll use the grid of the stretcher to establish a structure that for the pore, so it's not mushy. And um, a painting like this is a complete accident, <laughs> truthfully. I mean, I pour, and then I, after I put that grid on, then I poured the blue splash, or, or maybe I did the gold first and poured the blue splash, splash, but I didn't predict how it would come out. And I'm interested in the two-sided paintings because people don't look at the back the same they look at the front, the same as they look at the front. They look at the, they, especially with the big paintings, they tend to look at the back kind of close up and at, an, at an angle, particularly the, the monochromatic material backs. Mm -hmm. They don't consider the, you know, and then when they go around to the front, they'll take a few steps back. So you never really see a two-sided paint. And that's what's really interesting. You can't because, uh, well, if you, if you saw a photograph of the front and the back, you'd say, well, I saw the, the painting. But in the space of the exhibition, the painting keeps producing itself because you see it in areas. You never really get the gist of it. And some people think, that's a problem. <laughs> but I particularly like that. I think that it makes the paintings continue to live in space in a way that is in this age, in, well, for the last hundred years, the paintings have been photographed, and the photography totalizes a painting image, even a Cezanne that has, that has like kind of a lot of kind of empty space. If you see a photograph of it, it's a very, very different painting than if you see it in life. In life, you look here, you look there, and in, um, and so in my, um, in a, this Tang show, I really was pleased with people darting from one painting to another and going back and forth, and they're not really getting the totality of the painting because in truth you can't. And that's what I like about the two sided paintings. Is that, sorry again to be buzzing around here, but is that, you made a comment once about this Barnett Newman, about this being the one painting that, that, you, stop. that you stop, right? Is I mean, and that and that's often written about this this painting of Newman's is that it's the one that sort of exceeds the field of vision, so it's enveloping of the viewer in in somewhat opposition to this idea of the painting kind of stamping itself out instantaneously on the viewer's vision. Well, Newman is very different than a lot of more than a lot of abstract painters, like say Ellsworth Kelly, because Newman it's the space it does keep it's it's it does keep the zip keeps the space moving, shifting. And then when you move back and forth, that's a very long painting. Um, it's never static. And if the Stations of the Cross, the black and white series that the National Gallery owns, those paintings are, there, there's a contradiction because they're very plain. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, but they maybe the plainness, just the canvas and the particular kind of black paint, whether it's magna, oil paint, acrylic, all different kinds of black. And the, the paintings just keep moving. 
I, it's, I don't quite understand it, but it's it, a very, very profound painting experience because it's not static, because so much contemporary abstraction became so graphic, like graphic design, mm -hmm. you know? And if you look at this painting compared to Stella's black paintings, for instance, which are, some of them are fantastic. I mean, I do love them, but it's just a very different experience because it's not a graphic fixed image. Mm -hmm. And you can't, and even the photograph of that painting, it's still moving. And there's like, they say there's 30 coats of cat red on that, and you can still see the weave of the linen. So he really knows how to paint. <laughs> Because um, the word the word that you use in relationship to this painting, I think, was convinced. You're convinced by it, which is interesting to me because it seems so fine, right? And I, and I take that this notion of being convinced by a painting to kind of be a kind of closure. And yet, listening to you talk about this and talking about the other Newmans is this idea that they they, they resist that closure. Yes, they resist they this kind of finality, and so that your sense of being convinced by something. Now to generalize, maybe more to think about being convinced by it, its openness or its or its on um, its lack of closure, right? Yeah. That, that lack of closure is itself the convincing piece of it, right, and, and it's right. ongoing. Right. Is that kind of would that be fair to say? Absolutely. It's about it's about looking at the painting on a certain day. You know, here, not there. That's what Newman said. Yeah. It, it's about being there. And, and experiencing that pain. And, and so is that, I mean, in some sense, is that the kind of philosophical piece for you, which is to, tr to try and produce paintings that have this quality of, of, of never being finished in yes. that sense? Not in terms of sense of like, I don't know when the painting is finished in this kind of cliche, but, but painting in a way that leaves that openness even once the paintings are finalized. Yes, I'm very interested in that. Um, let's go back up to, again, apologies for the, the quick slide show. Um, there's, there, there, there's, some, there's some sort of t types here. I mean, there's the, 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 the two-sided paintings for which the grid provides this, this kind of armature and this way of working both sides, which I, I think is interesting, and this, this doubling of the givens of painting. Right. So you've talked from the material standpoint. It's there's that there's this great quote. I think I think uh, and, I, and I hate doing this name dropping thing, but Gilles Deleuze does this thing where he talks about how the painting the blank canvas is never blank, right? That the can that the, the painter's job is to kind of paint away or to excise the entire history of art that lays embedded within the within within any quote unquote blank canvas. Um, and, and you take that in a, in a more materialist direction to say that there's no canvas that's blank because there's the warp and the weft and there's the material of the paint or anything, the, the stretcher bars and the grid. So there are these givens that are there. Um, and what I find interesting is that do you, do you think of the, the practice of then applying paint and working the surface and, and applying these other elements to it as simply producing more givens? Huh. Because whatever, the painting is not a given. The, the painting at the end is not a given, like the stretcher is a given and the canvas is a given. It goes into some other place that's quite mysterious, actually. And I, I am a true process artist, and I do not predict the paintings at all. Uh, not at all. And um, I mean, I don't even quite remember how I made the paintings half the time. They just, they just kind of happen. And I'm, I'm, you know, surprised isn't the right word. I just kind of accept them, but they are different than me. And they're different than my intention. I am kind of the agent, you know, of doing this, but they aren't me. And that really interests me. I don't know what they are, but I, I stay very interested in them. And then, I find that very, uh, that itself is compelling because it, it, it sounds like it could fall off into this world of self-expression, which I know that No, you, but that's not. Exactly, and I know that you're resistant to that. Right. But that always seems to be the place that many artists would go, is that, that like this kind of, 
the that that there is this kind of internal um, part of the self, whether it's emotional, spiritual, what what have you, that is being externalized. And I know that, that you are resolutely against that idea. I'm totally, yeah, because that just I don't even understand that at all. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, what is expressive in my experience of looking at other people's art, and you can never see your own art with complete objectivity in any way, but in looking at other people's art, what I find most expressive is size and scale. And scale is not something that can be taught. And it's deeply expressive. If you look at Pollock's scale, for instance, he can get a huge amount of space on a postage stamp uh, etching. And I just, I find that deeply expressive, but I don't know what it's expressive of, which is a lot different than expressionism, you know, which is really one of the worst words that ever in, entered in, you know, of the descriptions, these categories of painting are worse than useless because they send people way down the wrong paths of thinking. And so people can't think for themselves, and they can't stand in front of a painting and analyze it for themselves, which anyone can do if they don't read the labels too carefully. So, <laughs> so what? So what? So don't read. Um, so when? So when someone's standing in front of these paintings, I'm not going to ask. You, I want to ask you, what do you want someone to get out of them? But I know you're going to say you want them to get out what they're going to get out. But how do you want them to analyze them? How well, I, that isn't part them? of my that isn't part of my calculations. Okay. I, I have no other no idea about other people and how they're going to see it. I have no idea, and so therefore I have no want <laughs> about. So, I really don't. So take yourself as the first viewer, as the first analyst of your own paintings, how do you take them? What is the... That's a really funny... Uh, 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 well, you. I look at them quite neutrally. When they dry and when they're, you know, I'm like, well, I can't do any more to it. I look at them quite neutrally. I don't like them a whole lot or generally dislike them a whole lot. They just are. They're like... Uh, you know, I work on, uh, outside on, and I have an asphalt apron in front of my studio and it's all stained with paint. And I often say that apron is the best paint I ever made, uh, best painting I ever made. And it just is. And uh, in that way, a painting is more like a rock that you would find than it is like the house that you built. For me it is, anyway. It's just like, well, what is that? Well. So, and so the idea that I want people to see certain things, and I'm the opposite in a certain sense from a lot of the, uh, you know, conceptual and minimalist heroes. I'm the opposite because I am the agent and I do stuff and the paintings do get made, but I stand neutral and they are paintings and I am me all the way, <laughs> you know? They are never an expression. They, they must be in some way an expression of me, but I don't know how that is. So it would be more, I like this word that you're using, agent, rather than, rather than artist, or, or exp, you know, that it's expressing some specific view, right? That's right. essentially reducing your role down to another set of causal, Activities right. and 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 un undo the the need for self persona ego expression all these kinds of things. Right. And but I appreciate also that you're saying that you're the opposite of the of the of the of the minimalist push because the argument that we would why well why not simply present the materials as is. Right. What do you mean, like buckets of paint? Yeah, buckets of paint. Well, uh, they, a bucket of paint, you see, you can't see the paint that well because it's just this little round top. And so when you throw it on the canvas, you can really see it a lot better. And the whole thing with color is that uh, color is a lot of times just, that's one, one of the lessons of Vera Rocas, is color uh, is a lot of times just acreage. 
The more expanse of a color you use, the more the color is going to express itself and communicate and go out there. And so, um, I forgot your question. The Matisse effect. No, I mean, that, but that's, but there is, but so there's a, but there's a, there's an intention there, right? I mean, so it's not, you're it's not. It's an intention not, not to control it. It's an intention not to control it, but it is an intention to see, to get a better vantage on the material. Because it to is, see it better. To see it better, right? But even that sounds, even that sounds subjective, right? Because it, to see it better would be like, you know, just get a better pair of glasses or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, all of a sudden you could go down the struggle, but there, there, you want a more objective version of being able to say, well, this, this is better than it is in the can. Right, I mean, that's the old Frank Stella thing, right? Like to see the paint, to get the paint as good as it was in the can, but on the can. Yeah, but you know, a, a, like a blue paint on a, in a can before it's on, it's, it really operates differently in relation to the illusion that painting naturally has. It really operates different. And the whole thing about Stella is he wanted to get rid of illusion. And, but I really don't. It's like I know that the painting has a certain kind of illusion. I mean, Clifford Still uh, has a very interesting kind of illusion because it's very material and very, um, oh, just very stated right there. But it's not, um, it has an illusion that's, that's very different. If you put that Clifford Still next to a Frank Stella a uh, striped black painting, um, that has an illusion to it that's really different than the Clifford Still. Even though it's paint, it's like the paint changes when it gets, changes when it gets out of the can and becomes a different kind of, of material doing something differently on that rectangle. When you make, you know, when you put the color on the rectangle of the canvas, it's not it's not material in the same way that it is in the can because it's on that, you know, the canvas. So it changes. It's just like if, if you're not the same person before you talk to some, you know, when you, when you talk to somebody, you're, you're a slightly different person than when you're not talking to somebody. <laughs> that, I, I, so that's where I think that you've got a very interesting Behind this, there is a kind of ethics to your painting, which is a kind of collaboration with the material. There are there's some values that are there in the in the work, in the agency, which are not just about putting it out there on the surface and, and having this literalist attitude and being separated from it. Yeah. Right? Um, and so, I like again, your your the way that you describe them keep coming back to these kinds of exchanges, mm -hmm. right? Um, like, like talking to some, you're not the same person when you're talking to somebody as when you're just by yourself. Right. Um, that, I feel like that exchange is embodied well in, in this work. Could you explain this a little bit? The, yes, that's the two paintings. people. In fact, I think that wasn't me. I think that painting was made by two of my assistants because uh, some of these small string paintings I've experimented with having just two assistants make them. But I picked all the colors. I have all this painted string. And then we made a grid. And then um, I wanted to do something that was a springy. It was springy. I wanted to do something springy. And then I got this idea of bangs. You know, so this, <laughs> this is, you know, and this is uh, the painting on the workbench uh, on which it was made. And I kind of fantasized about showing it on the workbench. But in, but in the end, it got, just got put on the wall with the string that's behind flowing down. You know, you could hang it double-sided or you could also hang them on the wall, especially if they have the string. And so... Um, but could you take just, just two steps back and tell our audience just how that process works? How yes, it's made? there's two people, one on either side. One of them has... A, I think I put the holes in, too. You put the hole in with an ice pick or with an awl in the grid. And it, it's a cheesecloth grid on that painting. And um, so you put holes, you know, randomly, or I think I had more holes at, a, at the bottom of the canvas. And then it's very crucial what, 
colors of painted string that you choose. And um, so it just, they just go back and forth, you know, push, 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 push. And you want people to think this is fun. Because <laughs> if they don't think it's fun, it's not going to be a good thing. So the two people were pretty into it because I think this is one of the first I ever did where I wasn't participating. And they're like, oh, we get to do it ourselves. This, this is the job interview for the studio assistant. <laughs> yeah. and, and you may get to do a string painting yourself. <laughs> but this is a, but this is, ends up being a very good um, uh, condensation in a way of, of and perhaps, here I'm speculating, of an approach to painting which has a kind of collaborative feel to it. Again, it sometimes feels cliche to say that the artists are collaborating with the materials on the production of the work, but there's, um, given that, that you are invested in what's on the other side in a way that uh, few, few artists seem interested, um, there has to be a, kind, a constant sort of recognition of the work that I'm doing here and how it's going to, how it's going to appear or how it's going to present a face that I cannot see. And in order to verify or in order to engage that other face, I will have to let go of this one mm -hmm. and not see this one either. Right, right. I mean, they're stained paintings. So if this is just an evolution of what Ellen Frankenthaler invented, and um, I think it's, it, the, I think the whole idea of the paint being in the canvas makes the canvas very important. It's what weight canvas, you know, you choose, and uh, of course Morris Lewis too. You know, he used very very thick number ten or number eight. And a lot of times when I look at a Morris Lewis and unfurled, I'll stand really close to the painting because what I really like to look at is the canvas because it's a beautiful number eight. So it gives me this, the, the paint gives me this space. Then I step up and I look really close if the guards don't stop. <laughs> so, I mean, um, most of these paintings, um, or a lot of them, I don't actually look at the back that much, you know, pay attention to the back that much, and they kind of just happen. And there's one in there that's a, a string painting, so I work the back of that painting, because on the, the string paintings, the front, the person that's on the front d ties the string. When, you're, when it comes to the end of the length of string, I say, tie, tie, <laughs> and they tie it. And so I have different, different um, assistants tie in different ways. Some of them really like to tie real tight to the canvas, and some of, some of them let the string kind of fall down. I'm really interested in how different every string painting is, depending on the assistance. When we put together some of these images, I'll come back to the boxes, but we, we were very interested in having this yeah. museum uh, brought into the conversation. I understand you spoke about this already, but could you give us Give us a little bit of background on why, why this is particularly important for you. This is the Mercer Museum in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. It's one of three handmade concrete buildings that Henry Mercer made uh, the early part of the 20th century from like 1908, I think, to 1916, over a period of eight years. And they were kind of made uh, with six men and a mule and a very, very early cement mix, gas, gas powered cement mixture, mixer. And he was a tile maker. He had been um, a curator at the Pennsylvania Muse Archaeology Museum and he became interested in, uh, in primitive methods of tile making. And his first tiles were simply casting stove plates um, and then he mixed imagery together. It's very postmodern what he did. I mean, his tiles are amazing, but more amazing to me are his concrete, handmade concrete buildings. And they have all of these holes in them, and you look through the holes and you see things through the holes, which I love. And that's like a poster. It's the way he decided to display the, the uh, stove plates are almost like a poster rack down there. 
I particularly love this building, which is high up in, in the Mercer Museum, F, eighth floor or something. And then this, it's, a, it's like the Guggenheim. It's a central a core, and then he has rooms. And you walk down a ramp, and every room features a 19th century craft, like hat making, baking, so on. So that raises the question of how architecture relates to right. to your own work, and, and we wanted to have this this image come soon after that because this is the entrance to your show that was at the Tang teaching music at Skidmore. Yes. And I understand at the Tang there was this choice to do these stat. Right. The, the curator Ian Barry, Ian Barry suggested this. These 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 stacked. Uh, uh, Arrangements. Yes, yes. Um, did that did that reveal anything to you? As well? Yes, uh, it did because it the uh, the space the architecture was activated in a very interesting way, and you would all you, there was no place in the gallery where you didn't see on the other side of the painting or above the painting another painting. So it's this whole idea of kind of experiencing the paintings as fragments, actually and um, just activating the um, viewing process. Because when I uh, was young, um, if you went especially to a lot of studios, of men's studios, they would have one painting on the wall and two chairs. And then you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> so you sit down and look at that one painting for the, I don't know how long. Do you have anything to drink? <laughs> That's what I always say. <laughs> anything to drink? <laughs> so this is like every single individual is looking at the show in a different way. It's very, very non, um, non-controlling. Uh, and, and so that really interests me. And this particular shot on the left, uh, that wood uh, structure I have that painting on, that painting is resting on just a, a two-inch cement block. So that was a, a revelation for me, is to get as low, to get painting as low, right down on the floor. That was pretty interesting, because even my stands are like six or 10 inches off the floor. So that had a relationship to gravity that was very interesting to me relative to using that upward you know, expanse of the wall. And uh, so I, I was very happy with my show because uh, it's a very beautiful gallery or a very impressive gallery, but I think I <laughs> you know this. So is this, um, I mean, not just the show, but would it be fair then to characterize that it wouldn't make a lot of sense to approach your painting in the in the, the standard address of the, of the single panel on the wall. That, in fact, the work demands either to be seen in this with these, with these armatures, the double-sided, or in these kinds of shots. That in some ways, like, if, if, the, if the work is, is going to be captured at all in reproduction, that installation shots that also capture the architecture would be the most valid way of doing justice to what the work is trying to Absolutely. do. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's very important. I mean, uh, I ha I have, and, uh, the photographer has to, is very important. And I, I've had, I had three people do installation shots. I didn't have it, but, but I did, and the museum had three people do installation shots. One person was just there at the opening, and, I, and they sent me a thumb drive, and theirs were almost the best. Um, and then one person's was pretty terrible. So, um, you know, it really, this, this is how the photographer sees the show. And they're all individuals. And then there's when the show is activated. And that, that's, when, that's a different photographer. And, and so it's activated in a different way. And, um, yeah. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one more pretentious esoteric question before I open it up to the audience for better questions than I'm going to have. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, there, was, there was another, there was another um, uh, something you said in an interview uh, 
where you you describe this kind of the of this doing with the paintings that the paintings are a kind of um, a kind of constant activity. It's not just related to process, but I was put in mind of this this uh, particularly with the work that involves the um, the cheesecloth and this this kind of right. this kind of um, what to my mind is this um, uh, a continuing kind of manual direct application working of the of the surface of the painting um, without without it getting too too far this this notion of something that is that is ready to hand that is like a tool that you sort of know how to use and suggest itself um, and then when the when that tool is broken, or when it doesn't function anymore, that it becomes present to hand, and that's when it becomes analytical, and that becomes the situation in the studio, of the painting on the wall of the two chairs, where you sit back and you're analytical of it rather than being engaged with it. Right. And it struck me that as you were talking to this other interviewer, you were talking about the sort of process of making paintings as this kind of, that you're in the painting and you're doing it, and then as you say, you're neutral, right? You get to this neutral state where you're neither in love with it, you neither hate it nor love it, and it's right. just kind of there. And that's the moment where all of a sudden you step back, which seemed to be this very melancholic way of thinking about making paintings, because it's not this sense of having achieved something, but it's the sense of working it to the point where almost it's broken or it's ruined. And that becomes the moment that you have to step back from it put it on display, and let others look at it analytically in the same way? No, I don't think of it as melancholic, because if something goes on living, I mean, the broken thing is, uh, um, you can either contextualize that word as, as a final thing, or you can contextualize it as something that um, keeps on producing itself. And that's the opposite of melancholic. Mm -hmm. I find actually the finalness, the final, I particularly, I mean, I love all kinds of paintings, but, but very, very refined paintings that are just painted to the nth degree, I find those paintings to be kind of melancholic. And I had an experience on Friday. I went to the Whitney with a class. And I went to the American, uh, you know, floor where they have their collection. And I have always loved Edward Hopper. I loved him when I, uh, when I was in high school. He was one of my first, you know, painters I loved. And I lived in the Midwest. I identified with the images. And, and then they had other, you know, 30s and 40s American, in, you know, representational painting painters. And I couldn't look at it. I couldn't look at it. They were so close, they felt so provincial and close, I couldn't stand it. And luckily, there was a huge Clifford Still hanging on the same floor, and I went to it like gasping for air. <laughs> and, you know, looking at the way he, he moved the paint to the edge, and not a tight edge, but kind of a messy edge often. And I'm like, I can breathe, you know? And so it's, it's not finished. It's not finished, and that's the possibility of abstract painting, that it's not finished. And um, it's, it's really different. A big, a big American abstract paintings from the 50s actually are really, really different paintings than, were, than happened before. I think they are. And I don't find them melancholic. I find them, you know, keep on, they're keeping on living. And then it's amazing. Yeah, that's really, I, I don't disagree with you. I didn't, and I guess I didn't, uh, melancholic, I think about the melancholy as a kind of productive, like an un, like melancholy is unfinished, right? Melancholy is just like inability to work through some sort of material from the past, not like nostalgia, right? Like melancholy is that even though it has this kind of negative connotation, it is a kind of continuation of a, of a state of being. And I guess you could pair that with then the other idea that this like, when something, when I'm always, I'm, there, was this, there was this great quote by Hollis Frampton in, from the, in the 1960s about how um, once, uh, once um, uh, uh, 
video had been produced. Like once video was on the scene, um, it was great because that meant film could become what it always meant to be. Film was now obsolete oh, yeah. because now you have now you have video, and now film is released from its charge of doing the work that video will now do, and now released from that charge, can make good on. And this is a this is sort of a different take. We can like make good on that utopian revolutionary promise that was always there at the beginning. Yeah. Right. But so that melancholy is always combined, right? The sort of like the end of something, the outmoding of something has to be combined also then with this other continuation or the sort of unleashing of its potentials again, right? It becomes, it becomes vibrant again, potentially. Right. And that, that is kind of what, that's my pretentious esoteric way of trying to talk about <laughs> this like, this, this thing that you were saying about your paintings is this like getting to this neutral Spot, because I don't think many people articulate getting their work to a neutral spot. Right? That doesn't that doesn't sound like it. But it, but getting to neutral is a way of of making it open for that kind of to go on. Yeah, to go on. To go on. Yeah, that's the main thing. Yeah. Well, you know, that's very interesting because I love experimental film, but I cannot go to the movies. I cannot. And a lot of times my friends, oh, I saw it. You know, you should go see it. It's really good. You'll like it. And I'll go, and I'll sit down in the seat, and in 10 minutes, and I have to go to these big, you know, cinemas that have 15 movies playing because I pop up in 15 minutes and sneak into another movie <laughs> and see 15 minutes of that and then get up and, because I cannot wait. I do most contemporary, you know, popular movies I cannot, I do not want to wait for the end. And it's like so, you know, telegraphed in a lot of movies and all. And I find it excruciatingly boring. Just excruciating. I don't know how people just sit there with their hands folded, waiting for the end. <laughs> whereas, whereas, a, whereas Andy Warhol's Empire is just. Great. Fantastically. <laughs> There's no ending. It's not going to end. It's not going to end as long as that building's there. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so before we continue to go on and on, I'm going to open it up to questions from our audience. Uh, yes, Jill. All right. So um, I just have a question about in terms of how do you know at what point you've done work in the scene because, I mean, obviously it's hard as an artist, especially with abstract art, like you said, is it ever done? Is there a point where you're just like, I'm done with it, I don't want to deal with it anymore, or is it that you take a break from it and you come back and you don't see anything else to do with it? That's a really good and very, very difficult question. I don't know if I can answer that. Um, a lot of times it's the blank, it's the blank material backs that tell me the end. Because a lot of times the painting is, are made by seeping the paint from the back. And so the color is really on the back. And so the, the, face of the, it's, the painting is face down on milk crates. And it's receiving the paint. And so I tend not to just put more and more paint on those backs, you know? It's like the paint soaks through the canvas, and a lot of times it's held in place by the cheesecloth on the front. And then I put it up, and uh, it, it doesn't feel right to go on adding, you know, adding paint to the back. So a lot of times it's determined by the way the back is, you know, because the back is kind of blank. You know, it's just like the real thing blank. And I really, I've gotten so I really like the backs of my paintings better than the fronts. Because they're so blank. And blank is a kind of neutrality. Well, I started doing this because I wanted to actually put some figures in an art. I'm interested in the whole uh, situation of an art exhibition. 
It's a, a very artificial situation, very different than a studio. And I wanted to actually put some images of figures in with my abstract paintings and then have my viewers come in and, and like be part of the show. And also it was a way to, um, I, uh, I, these are boxes and, and do, you, do you have any other that are, that are actually in, like, in, well, like for instance, there's, there's a lot of times two of these panels are put on one base and I work inside between the two panels. And so I'm right up, here's the painting and I can't step back. So I'm forced to paint in a really different way. And so let's see the one with the two again. Yeah, on the other side of the, I, I actually had two, fig, two models, two models here. And uh, on the other side, there's paintings on the other side as well. And uh, so this one was worked, I was actually in the box. When I did the guy in the black suit, I was actually in the box and that's uh, muslin and it's wet. And so, you know, I couldn't step back and he was standing there and I just could do it. Like, it's a, to have this big wet piece of material and be really close and it's, it's very uncomfortable and it's very interesting because I cannot do things in a normal way. I'm forced into this way of working that's like very uncomfortable and I just don't know and I'm pretty old and I can only and I'm inside the box and I can only move up and down like that. My knees are creak, creak, creak. <laughs> it's just like exciting to me to work like that. <laughs> Yes, this process. And gel medium is one of my main materials, and that's always wet and sticky. And you have big pieces of material that are all wet with gel medium. Your own body is implicated in it a lot because you kind of stick to the painting. You know, peeling yourself off the painting and peeling the gel medium off your hands, and it's you don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> it's, it's so great. I have this image of, uh, you know, how to, how to make painting as unfun and productive as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for that. <laughs> um, in, order, in order to get fantastic results. I have also put in mind, there's this great essay on, there's this whole series of, of, of authors on their, on their practice, and John McPhee is this great nonfiction writer based at Princeton. And he's the first to talk about how how writing for him is just utter hell all the time. And, and, and the way that he talks about his practice makes you wonder, like, why well, just don't write anymore? Just go do something else. And it, you know, thirty books later, and the yeah, yeah. posters and things like that. But uh, uh, it seems like a good a good parallel. Yeah. Other other questions? Yeah. In the back. And uh, it, it varies from work to work. Uh, look, let's see that red, yellow, and blue painting, the, the one, the big, the big, just as, yeah. There. Um, uh, somebody in my, in my first lecture at Claremont um, asked me, a, a little girl, <laughs> asked me a very good question. Do you ever use uh, primary uh, colors? And primary colors are interesting. A lot of contemporary painters don't use them. And if you think about how important they are, they are in the history of 20th century painting with Mondrian, um, and the, the primary colors are, are very abstract. They are not evocative of light, time of day, nature. And I actually very seldom use red, yellow, and blue because my colors a lot of times have to do with the weather because I work outside a lot. So, but this particular painting um, is called um, um, 
in response to Barnett Newman's, I, who's afraid of red, yellow, and blue? This painting is, I'm not afraid of red, yellow, and blue. <laughs> and so, um, but my color is, is really intuitive and um, just kind of a lame thing to say, and I'm aware of it, but um, I, it's very much, it's very much, um, you know, in response to the weather, because my studio is behind my house, and it's, I turn on the heat when I go in there, so if I make a painting, you know, in the winter, it's cold in there. It's really cold. And so, you know, the color is in response to that physical situation. And then in the summer, I love to work outside in the summer when it's really hot. And then I have a few that I've made in the fall. <laughs> you know, so they're, they're uh, usually, normally, have to do with the weather, my colors. Um, that was her daughter, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> No, I'm open to all the colors. I love, you know, I don't have a favorite color. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm not as good a colorist as many, and, and I don't know, I never really learned color theory, but I would have to say that color in the world is a lot different than color theory that you just learned because color in the world always has a sheen to it, it has a texture to it, and it, there's the light situation that you see it. So it's, uh, you cannot separate um, actually color from the texture or the surface or the materiality of, of the whatever. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so you mentioned um, a lack of concern with the outcome of your processes and how they relate to the viewers sometimes, and I'm just interested in what structures, if at all, your process, what kind of uh, restrictions or limitations do you assert on yourself, such as painting in a box, which is extremely out there and special, and <laughs> do, they, do they serve a certain conceptual purpose, do they serve a personal purpose, or is it just intuitive, or is it just like a fun challenge? I'm sure it's a bit of both, but if you could speak to that a bit more. Well, I, I do feel it's a very limit. A lot of people would say, well, it's, her practice is very conservative because she works on the rectangular stretcher. You know, and what about Linda Beglis that did throw latex paint on the floor and stuff? So in that way, I, I have a, I'm definitely just a painter. I'm just a, I consider myself a traditional painter. And, um, plein air, kind of booth. Yeah, plein air, traditional <laughs> plein air. Absolutely. Backyard, plein air. That's right. That's right. So, um, you know, um, so the, the, that's the limitation. I'm a traditional painter who, who makes a painting on a rectangular stretcher. And that's a, that's a very strong limitation. And um, as far as the boxes go, you know, the, the, uh, they're about that thick. So the stretcher really is kind of like a shallow box. And uh, that's a whole different thing. It's kind of new for me, and I'm really interested in it. I wish I was, you know, 30 years younger, because I think it has great possibilities. But it is what it is. Yeah. I really like what you talked about when you were constantly bringing up really shallow um, color layers in your space and how the paint looks different in the can and it goes on to the material. And then how the groupings change once they're in a different space. And now you're saying again, like the color looks different because it's got a texture. So all of this relational stuff is so fascinating to me. I'm wondering, did you ever get to a place, now it goes, you say you need to get to a neutral place with the gun. Mm -hmm. What if you, have you ever brought something into a space where it's supposed to be shown and all of a sudden your neutrality has gone away and you're going, uh-oh, oh, that wasn't supposed to look that way. I got to pull it, I got to change it. Well, you can't change it. <laughs> you know, but that is why it's good to show your work. You know, I, I'm not one of these artists that wants to hide away, you know, and think I'm great. 
I want to try to put it, my, you know, it's been kind of my policy in life to show every time I can. You know, every time I'm offered, you know, the opportunity to show my work, I do. Because it is a revelation. The paintings are not the same in my studio that they are in the exhibition. The first time I had a one-person exhibition uh, was at Rosa Esmond Gallery in 1975, and I was waitressing at the time. And, uh, you know, the manager wouldn't let me uh, take the day off, so I had somebody else install my show. And I walked in, and, you know, I was about, I don't know, I think I, think I was about less, a little less than 30, pretty young. And I walked in, and I'm like, oh, oh, this isn't what I thought I was doing. <laughs> and I was really shocked. I was really shocked. And I never have forgotten that shock. You know, so it always is kind of shocking for me. I don't actually know what I do. There is, I don't think it's a good thing necessarily, but there's this gap between what I do, you know, there's, I don't, under, I don't know what I do, actually. And so that's why I do really like showing my work when I have a new body of work, you know, so I can see what, what in the world it is. Okay, yes. Uh, that over the years, has your um, understanding of your work's relationship to pleasure changed? I've always found painting to be very difficult. And when I was young, in high school, and then going into college, I thought I would be a writer. And um, I wanted to go away to school, to a good writing school. And I was in Columbus, Ohio, and my parents said, absolutely not, we have a very good school right here, Ohio State University, you're going here. And the uh, painting department at that time was a very good painting department, where the English department wasn't that good at all. So, and I, as soon as I got there and started hearing about conceptual art, you know, I got really interested because I always thought I was kind of inept, you know, and uh, with my art making, and I've always felt that, and I've always felt that it's very important, my ideas are very important, I follow my ideas about making, you know. So I've never, I've never, had the idea, and I've never admired the idea of being a good artist, you know, good. It, it isn't like I don't really appreciate good artists, I do, but I know I'm not one. I know I'm something else. So the pleasures are intellectual pleasures? Yes, they're intellectual pleasures. And has that stayed pretty constant from the beginning? Or? Yes, it, it has. But uh, I didn't have the intellectual materials when I was young because you know, art form was the main thing, and Michael Fried, and it was very authoritarian. And I have always, I always resisted that very much, and I don't agree with it. And I've always felt as that a, a, a young artist can think through the history of art themselves. Yes, themselves. And you do not need these authorities to tell you what's good or how art should be developed. And so I'm actually, I think the fact I come up in a time of a lot of authoritarian ideas, Greenberg and the minimalists, and they were so, and I, my whole practice is probably pushed to resistance, to authority, you know? Does it ever in the studio strike you that what you're doing is completely and utterly absurd? And does that interject? Yes, but I think a lot about life and maybe even I mean what are we who are we in this universe you know I do I really do think that absurdity is at the root of everything you know and and when we have this political moment where there's this overt absurdity you know it, it almost seems like it's playing out something that's always been there you know and so yeah, it's, it's kind of scary. Absurdity is kind of scary, too. So I think on that note of the absurd, we should break for cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Donna.